Great. Um, I'm pretty sure we're live now. Let me just double check here. Yep, I see us. Okay. Someone's already saying hi. The comments are super delayed, guys. So if you are joining us and you saw our big intro with us going, are we on? Are we on? Um, we get a little delayed on the comments. So if you're typing comments into the chat, it might take us a like minute, up to a minute before we see them. But hello to everybody. Welcome. I'm so glad that you guys can join us today. I am here with two very special women to talk about SCAD heart attacks. And full disclosure, um, the first woman that I'm going to introduce you to is actually my sister. Um, so today I have with me my sister, Mary, as well as Catherine Leon. She is the founder of the SCAD Alliance. Um, and to start off, I'm I'm just want to have both of them introduce themselves and tell us a little bit more about their story with SCAD. So um, I'm going to start with my sister, Mary. Why don't you take it away? We'd love to um, get to know you a little bit better and in your journey with SCAD. Sure. Um, so I'm Jen's sister, Mary Swigert. Um I. Uh, had a SCAD heart attack um, when I was 34, so um, almost five years ago. Um, it's kind of ironic. I, I work in healthcare. I work for a medical device um, manufacturing company that um, I used to work installing and repairing in hospitals, uh, patient monitoring and anesthesia equipment, cardiology equipment. Um, so I've spent a lot of time in the healthcare industry and working in hospitals. I never expected to be uh, connected to the same devices that I actually installed. But after I had my heart attack multiple times, I had been put on my own equipment that I had supported. So it came full circle. I really um, feel my own mission at work these days. But um, work was one of the contributing factors for me. Um, I had. Um, at the time that I had my heart attack, I had a nine month old uh, baby. I had stopped nursing um, and it wasn't quite like hormonally wasn't quite back to normal yet. Um, and he was my third. When I had my second child, I stopped working for a year and I was desperate to get back to work, realized I really wanted a career. And I went back and when I had my third, I said, I am not gonna slow down. I am not gonna stop. I, I can do this. I can I can have three kids. I can have my career, and I can excel at all of those things. And when I came back from maternity leave after um, uh, after having him, I was promoted. I was managing a team of of six people who took uh, customer calls twenty four seven. So I would wake up. I'd be breastfeeding the baby, and I'd be getting uh, escalations overnight from. Um, the on-call folks on my team. I think for like four months, I probably between April and August probably didn't have a full night's sleep, not once. Um, and I was exhausted and completely stressed out. Um, and one day um, in early August, uh, my husband took the kids and um, I was going to just do some lawn work and I hadn't been feeling right. I had some weird like like um, dizziness and I had one small occurrence of chest pain a few days before. He took the kids and I was outside weed whacking and I was holding a weed whacker and actually with my left arm I was directing it with my right arm I was supporting and I felt just pain coming up my arm and my only reaction was to be irritated because I really wanted to get the yard work done. So I continued to do what I was doing until I it was coming up my jaw and into my back. And I realized something was very, very wrong. And I just didn't feel good. So I went inside and I sat down in the garage and I, we have like a little step on our garage door. So I sat on the step and all I, could, I, I felt like I want my head to be down. Like I want to be laying down. Um, but I was convinced if I laid down, I wouldn't get back up. And so I just sat there and I waited. And um, after maybe, I mean, it seems like such a long time when it's occurring, but I, I think the whole thing might have been, couldn't have been more than five or 10 minutes between when it started and when it, when it subsided. 
Um, you know, I got back up, I went back out, and I finished weed whacking and mowing the lawn. <laughs> and my husband got home, and um, it had been, you know, he got home maybe half an hour after I'd finished, and we had lunch. And I said to him, I had this crazy pain in my chest. And um, I said, you don't think I had a heart attack, did you? And I felt, I felt nuts even saying that. I was like, but I couldn't, there was no other explanation. And he said, no, you're probably fine. But, you know, like, just relax. Go lay down on the sofa. I'll make lunch. And so I laid down. I took a nap. And then that afternoon, we took the kids to the pool. We played tennis. And at, like, 10 o'clock after having dinner, I, I uh, contacted our mother, who had also had a previous heart issue. And she urged me to go to the hospital. And that's when, you know, after about five or six hours of sitting in the hallway in the ER, um, they came and told me that I'd had a heart attack. And it's funny because you can tell something is um, bad because the nurse came in and she kind of looked at me and she looked up at the monitor, you know, checking my heart rate, checking my, you know, uh, data there. and. And she said, we think you had a heart attack, uh, but we really, it doesn't make any sense, and we're not sure why. Um, but they had done enzyme testing over the space of the five hours that I'd been there. And um, the specific enzyme they were looking for, troponin, had been um, rising to levels that weren't normal. So, um, you know, I don't want to belabor it. That's how I... Um, Eventually got the diagnosis of SCAD, um, found a specialist at Mass General um, who was amazing and um, really helped me recover. And everything today is perfectly normal. If, if you're part of Jen's workout group, then you've probably seen me in her stronger classes. And um, luckily, I'm not, I don't have any issues from it. I, I'm not on medications. I'm, I'm like, me, but I think it's really important that other people, other women understand um, that it can happen and that will allow them to advocate for themselves because not everybody is as lucky as I was that it got picked up and that they weren't sent home. So, yeah. and that's how, that's how I got to meet eventually Catherine and found out about SCAD Alliance because my doctor um, is on the board of Scat Alliance, so. Yeah, we were, we were lucky when it came to Mary's heart attack that we live in an area, I feel like we were lucky that we live right outside Boston in an area where we have access to people who are specializing in this. Um, I don't even know what would have happened if we were, you know, somewhere where there wasn't very much because even when you went in, like you had said, they they had no explanation for why someone this would happen to someone your age in in shape that you were in when you went in. Nobody would have. I remember talking to you that the um the day before the day it happened before you had gone in and she drove herself in, by the way. She didn't no call nine one one or anything. No, she didn't do that. that. Right, we do that. Yep. <laughs> Drove herself in. I remember talking to you shortly before you went in saying, they're probably going to send you home telling you it's anxiety. It's probably nothing, but you need to, you need to have it looked at. And thank goodness that you did. Um, anyway, why, why I would love to hear a little bit more about Catherine's story because you were even, you were so much earlier, um, like time-wise, I think, was it 2003? Yeah. Yes, 2003, and really, in many ways, I could just say ditto to yes. Mary's story. <laughs> Lots of similarities, um, but yes, uh, it was back in 2003, and I had a 20-month-old, and I was pregnant, um, due to deliver my second baby, who's actually going to be 18 tomorrow, and um, I had had, you know, seemingly a fine pregnancy. Um, but just, you know, after delivery, 
went through that few days of feeling like, wow, you know, I'm on top of the world, I can do anything. And then I would just have these gradual declines and like more of like a mind fog and more physical fatigue, but I didn't really recognize it. Um, you know, to the point of where I was nursing and I would wake up and I'd be like collapsed over the baby. Like I'd passed out and had no idea that I had passed out while I was nursing him, which was not very safe. Um, and then it's funny that Mary mentioned that moment of wanting to just, just lay down and never move again. That, that heaviness of your, I can't hold my head up anymore and I just gotta lay down. And I had my moment um, in a library parking lot <laughs> next to an extremely busy road. You know, I had the baby in the car seat bucket and I had my toddler and a huge armful of books, which was like ridiculous. I don't know why I'd gotten out 20 or whatever it was. And I just put the baby bucket down. I let go of Ian's hand. I kind of let the books fall on the ground. I was just in the middle of a parking lot. And, that, and then slowly my brain said, oh wait, you can't do this. This isn't right. So get in the car and go home. We all took a nap. And when I woke up, I had an excruciating headache in the back of my head. Um, I tried to nurse Evan, the baby. Luckily, Ian was still asleep. And I just, I just couldn't. I just felt like my arms weren't working. Nothing was working. And I started with that heavy pressure in my chest. And like Mary said, kind of up into the back of my shoulder blades, a little higher and the numb arms and the shortness of breath for sure. Um, fortunately, my husband came home and was able to help with the baby. But at that point, I just begged him to call an ambulance because I just had that, they call it the impending doom feeling. Went by ambulance to the hospital, got checked out for a pulmonary embolism because that's what made sense to them as a new mom, a second delivery. Um, didn't have one, of course. And they were kind of like, well, go home and call your primary doctor and get your gallbladder checked and see if you can control your asthma better, which really hadn't been an issue. Um, so it was all very surreal. Like I just, your gut's saying that had to be my heart. And yet I had no prior heart history or knowledge or awareness. Um, so I just went home and I did what they said, but after the primary visit, she gave me a new inhaler and booked me on Monday for a gallbladder scan. <laughs> um, and on Saturday, I had even more severe symptoms all day long. And I kept thinking, well, it's not my heart, so I'll just sit here and deal. But finally, um, you know, my mother begged my husband, just please take her to the hospital. And that time I was admitted. And then on Monday had the catheterization that showed the blockage and I ultimately had um, double double bypass surgery. But I think, you know, what is so important about what Mary said too is that um, you do have to advocate for yourself. And, and that's why I'm so pleased to be and grateful <laughs> to be on this this Zoom chat with you all because um, we're not we're not trying to scare anybody by any means, but it's just um, by educating yourself about the, what's out there and how to understand your own health history and your own body symptoms, you can be prepared for any kind of health emergency, hopefully not SCAD, um, but that, that's the goal. We just wanna make sure that the word gets out and that people understand it and can educate others as well. Right. Did you want me to go into the slides? Yes, or? yes. Why don't you, um, okay. if you want to start, so um, Kathy has a slide presentation for us that's going to give you a lot better of an idea of exactly um, what SCAD is. So why don't you um, pop that up on the screen share? Um, okay, let me see. I appear to be in the wrong view. Does that make any difference? We can see it. Okay, yeah, okay. <laughs> Not my strong suit here. Um, but just to kind of reiterate what we're saying about SCAD, and it, I'm not sure if I even said it, but it's spontaneous coronary artery dissection. And as a primary doctor once said to me, you know, wow, that sounds as bad as it is. <laughs> it's like, yes, it is. It's spontaneous. 
and it is an artery which supplies you know blood and oxygen to your heart and body um so it is it is very devastating but the thing about it is although it's atypical in presentation the symptoms are typical so you know we'll go through that in a second that um you can pretty much think of the spectrum of what they call classic male pattern symptoms all the way to what they call the vague female symptoms and anything on that span is considered um, a symptom for SCAD. So just this is just a visual of what I was talking about before. Here's my little chunky monkey. <laughs> and, you know, we're both rosy cheeked, you know, happy as can be, totally fine. But then, you know, here we are like four months later, excuse me, four weeks later. And this was at a family picnic. And it literally was 85 degrees this day. We live outside of DC, so the humidity is off the charts. And I'm in this massive polar fleece, <laughs> put long sleeves on toddler. You know, thank heaven I'd had this beer back here because I think that might be what saved me in the end, <laughs> keeping my blood moving. But um, this was just right before, you know, I went in for that second, second visit and ended up being admitted and having open heart surgery. And this is the sketch that the surgeon drew for my family. And if you can see here, this, this black patch, that was a 90% blockage of the left main artery. So everything down flow here was not getting fed. And those arteries, you know, bring what the heart needs to keep pumping to keep your body going. So that's, you know, that's the danger of having a blockage of any type is that it's starving your heart muscle. Um, and, you know, the heart muscle is, we only get one. And, uh, you know, that's why it's so critical to, to get emergency care as soon as you feel unwell, because that's, that's the secret to preserving that muscle and keeping your heart healthy. So just to reiterate the actual symptoms that you might have heard of before, um, a lot of people say, oh, it's chest pain. You have to have, feel like ha you have to feel like you have an elephant on your chest. But really it's it can be everything from like a squeezing or a cramping feeling in your chest. It can feel like pressure, like a, I said, an anvil. I felt like that, you know, roadrunner Wile E. Coyote cartoon with this massive thing smashing me on the chest. Um, a tightness or just heaviness, like you just feel like, oh, I just can't, you know, there's something not right. Some people have a rapid heartbeat and that's like a fluttery feeling in there, which could be an arrhythmia that's triggered. Um, some people describe their arm pain. Others like me say numbness. Uh, it can be in your shoulder. The as Mary mentioned that up into your jaw pain, that that's kind of the, to me, that coincided with that feeling of doom. It was like that, that is really not something you feel every day in your life. So that's a huge warning sign. You know, some people get, feel like they have a you know, crick in their neck, upper back pain. Some people have stomach distress. Um, perspiration is a symptom. The exhaustion, that to me, people have asked me about that a lot and it's it's not like your typical oh my gosh i'm so tired i could take a nap it is like you just don't even feel human anymore and i can remember having a sensation of like looking through a screen door like it was like a gray veil over my eyes and thinking wow something's wrong but my brain i just can't even go there i don't even know where to begin <laughs> to the point of you know, like I was pumping to try to feed my baby supplemental bottles and nothing was coming out. And I was just like, okay, here's like five drops <laughs> stick in the fridge. And it didn't even, it didn't even register that that was wrong. Um, yeah, I, I would say with exhaustion, I noticed it the whole week before and I couldn't figure it out. Like yeah. I, I was, don't tell my employer. <laughs> I was falling asleep <laughs> in the middle of the day, like so exhausted 
that I just put my status as away and fell sound asleep for two hours in the middle of the day one day that wow. week. I just couldn't, I, I didn't know what was going on. <laughs> wow. Oh my. Yeah. In hindsight, isn't it? It's just crazy to, to look back. Line up at the end, you realize it, but during the week, there were so many little things that happened that I, I didn't connect the dots. Exactly. Exactly. Um, but that I'm kind of belaboring all this, sorry, but you know, just the dizziness again, some people say lightheaded, um, some people do faint and that would be a big warning sign and, um, definitely seek care if it, there's an unexplained fainting episode and then the headache too. Uh, mine was in the back of my head, but you hear all kinds of, um, different explanations of, you know, like it wasn't a normal headache. It was, it was unique. And I think that's kind of the thing. All these symptoms can be explained by something else, but what you're trying to train yourself to do is to think, is this right for me? Is this, is this fitting with who I was last week? Or is this a new sensation that does not feel right and I need to get myself checked out? Um, just to kind of, I hope people can see this. I didn't think about making it bigger, but the whole idea with SCAD it's not plaque based. And I imagine everybody in your group is pretty savvy about, you know, their health and fitness and nutrition and whatnot. And the idea being that SCAD is not a plaque buildup. It's not cholesterol plaque. You know, this is not typically, you know, related to high blood pressure. Some people do have high blood pressure, but it's not related to a traditional coronary disease risk factor. So, um, you know, we all, feel that we have been helpful in our diet and we've taken care of ourselves, you know, whether we were runners or whatever kind of fitness regimen we followed swimmers. Um, so it really does, you know, strike you out of the blue because you feel like you're a healthy person with no um, history of any kind of disease. Um, and as you can see here, it's hard to see, but over on the right side of the diagram, there's this darker little triangle area that represent the dissection itself. So it's the spontaneous tear. We don't know why, but um, it allows the blood that should be in this true lumen, it's called, to eke and seep into this area. And then you're creating this blood clot. And as it fills up between the two layers, it squishes the, the true lumen where the blood should be flowing. So like in this instance, you're basically getting half the blood flow of what it should be, you know, and this, and this can collapse down depending on the individual to like mine was the 90% blockage. So that's what's causing the, the chest pain from the lack of blood flow. Um, and this is another representation where it, it actually, the dissection leads into a full tear of the tissue flap. So that sometimes will reverse back on itself and the actual artery will block the the lumen and not let the blood flow. Um, so fortunately with imaging technology, the experts in SCAD have determined ways to discern the blood clot and this type of blockage from the plaque blockage. Because in the past, when most doctors saw one of us with a blockage, they just assumed it was plaque and they just rush in there and stick a stent which is a little metal scaffolding that props it back open. But the problem is if the artery's torn and it's actually blood and not plaque, you can actually create a bigger tear and a bigger problem. So the, the thought nowadays is to be more conservative and try medication management. Um, but it's just unique to each patient. But um, in terms of what we've learned so far, there are a lot of great research studies going on all over the world. We have, um, there's, you know, U.S. is involved both at Mayo and our own ISCAD registry. Um, Canada has a multi-center registry. The U.K. has a multi-center registry. And we're learning more and more as the international community comes together that, you know, there are registries in Italy, Spain, you name it, Japan. So, the, pre, the um, preliminary information that has come out and that most are replicating is that it is predominantly female. 
80% to 20%. And, but it's interesting to note this, this percentage of the peripartum is actually going down over time the more studies they do. It used to be thought to be the, the only reason for SCAD, that's what they told me. And, the, and then the more that we learn, the more we realize it's a complicated picture. It's not just a matter of don't have another baby and you'll avoid SCAD. It's literally um, much more complex than that. Average age is 42 to 52, but we've seen late teens to 60s, 70s. Um, we do believe in general that it might be a perfect storm situation of hormones and then a form of stress in conjunction with that, whether it's exertional stress, which tends to be the case in men, um, but physical, um, excuse me, emotional stress as well, um, or like I say, kind of a perfect storm where perhaps you've had a very emotional event, a physical trauma, um, and it you know correlates with your cycle, and we just don't really know yet. But there's that order of research. And there's also some research that's looking into more of the um, kind of mechanics of the artery, like, you know, whether it's a form of a vascular disease that is triggering it. So as I mentioned, the imaging has been a, is very valuable. And these are two technical types of imaging that's not really important to this conversation, but they are finding ways to look at the artery in a more safe manner to determine whether it is plaque or blood, so that's good. Um, as I mentioned, the PCI, that's actually what stenting, that's an abbreviation for stenting, is not really recommended, although a lot of people do have stents, and they, you know, there's variations on the success rate, but until more doctors are aware of SCAD, you know, we just have to do our own advocating to try to avoid any kind of tampering with the artery and I'm, I'm serious like if I go in I ask for a non-invasive approach I don't want anybody in my artery unless you know it's really truly an emergency um these are more uh probably I should have not <laughs> been so specific on this slide I'm sorry um the recurrence this statistic is out of date I would say because with each study it's becoming um, more like a 10 years, five to 10 year timeline that they're able to look at. Um, but this tortuosity, that is something that has been an interesting area of study because that's something that people can actually look at their family history and know like, oh yeah, you know, my mother had a scan one time and she had very corkscrewy carotid arteries or you know, there are different clues that we can learn from our family history that might make us more prone to a dissection. The biggest one is this word fibromuscular dysplasia, abbreviated as FMD. And the, the range of people who have both FMD and SCAD varies by study. Um, I believe it's like from 40% to 65% is the statistic now. But a lot of times what they'll do is if a person has SCAD, they do a, a very thorough discussion about their family history and learn if they've had a lot of stroke or you know mysterious uh, un unexplained death and that type of thing. And then they can do imaging scans that look for this vascular irregularities. It can look like a string of beads. It can be you know, tortuous, like we mentioned. There's different versions of it that they can use to decide whether you would have this disease. Um, then I apologize for that survival rate. I think that was referencing a previous bullet that I didn't take out. Um, the biggest important thing is that so far we think that one to 4% of acute coronary syndrome is SCAD. And acute coronary syndrome is everything from unexplained chest pain to a heart attack to sudden cardiac arrest. Um, and that's kind of the, the thing that we have to tease out is like, what is the actual statistic for the heart attack piece of it? Um, they do believe that SCAD is the number one cause of heart attack in pregnancy. And they also believe so far that 40% 
of myocardial infarction in women under 50 is caused by SCAD. And that, you know, that's a big deal. <laughs> I'm sure Mary was told too that, you know, oh no, it's really rare. You don't really have to be too concerned about it. Um, but that, that's a concerning statistic. So I'll stop there um, for now and we'll get back to questions and stuff. Yeah, I did have um, I did have some questions that that people wrote in. Um, so we did kind of learn a little bit about what SCAD is and what makes it different from your quote unquote typical heart attack that we all think of. Even though it it sounded like the the symptoms that you're going to experience are going to be very similar to what is a typical heart attack. Um, so, so that was good because I did get that question. Um, some other questions uh, that were were written in. So, um, and and you kind of touched on this too, as far as who should be concerned about it. Um, in that, you, you are maybe going to start to see some family family traits that might tell you that that you are particularly prone to this, maybe. We're learning more and more, and um, it's been interesting how a lot of the study has come from patients' experience and us sharing our stories with the clinicians and the researchers. So over time, you know, Mary, chime in because, you know, we, we've brought up things like, what about migraine headaches? It seems like we all have migraine headaches. I, I you know, have like. A, Son who got his first MRI at five years old for migraine headaches. And my mother gets them. My mother had a, it's funny that you say this because I've learned more about my, our family health history after this. She had a grandmother who had a stroke at, in her 50s, who yep. lived to be 90 plus. And my mother had a related heart issue when she was in her, um, I think, mid 50s as well. And so, you know, all of these different conditions tend to run in, I think, families, and you don't necessarily connect the dots between migraine headaches and mm. and heart attacks. <laughs> right, right. Um, so yeah, it's very... you'll think I'm making this up, but my what my 18 year old when he was five, he had a workup for migraine headache. Yeah. My mother and my grandmother had <laughs> migraines, and hey. my grandmother had a stroke in her late 40s. So it's, it's, it really is, I think we're like uncovering a whole new <laughs> revolution in the way people handle their healthcare. Cause it's, it, it makes clear that we really do have to know our, and not just our own history, not like, oh, I, you know, broke my ankle when I was eight and I, you know, my last tetanus shot was whenever it's literally, okay, who did have migraines in my family? And, you know, you know, who, who was that? You know, what was the story behind that heart attack that granddad had that nobody wants to talk about? Or, you know, just not to be morbid, but to literally look for patterns in your family. And, you know, there's interest in autoimmune diseases and interest in thyroid conditions. And a lot of the different, um, again, they're patient reported um, complications that we perceive, or maybe a coincidental use of tons of uh, anti-inflammatory, um, you know, like NSAIDs or, you know, there's talk of different times in our lives where we've had, you know, huge amounts of really strong antibiotics. Could that have been a trigger? So lots of interest in all these types of areas. So although there's no firm answer for the person who had the question, I would just say that it's more like you know, opening up your eyes to controlling stress and, you know, do you have migraines and is there a way to, you know, safely control them? Um, you know, do you take a ton of anti-inflammatories and is there a way to work around that um, through a different kind of, you know, therapy, whether that's massage or meditation or whatever. So it's, it's kind of looking at the bigger picture of our health and our health history among our relatives. I actually just got a question coming in. I'm not sure you're going to have a, a hard and fast answer for it, but um, someone just asked if 
You have FMD in your carotid arteries, but not anywhere else. Does this contribute to SCAD? That's one of the interesting questions because you can look at it. Well, this is why we need so much research, really, because yeah. you know the FMD in the carotids, that is a vascular bed. Now, does that mean that your heart has the same problem? They, that we don't know that yet. It, I think it's gonna be one of those situations where some people do, some people don't. And there are a lot of us who have had SCAD and then are evaluated and do not have FMD. So there's so many different avenues that are still under research and we need more of it, obviously, on bigger, more diverse populations. But that's a great question yeah. because you know, we, we tend to have, we have like two populations. We have some people that had carotid issues first and then they had a heart issue. And then some who had the heart issue and then maybe the carotid later. You know, some have a renal involvement. Usually that's significant for the FMD population. So these, these, these categories are definitely under focus in the research. So even though we don't have concrete answers right now, I mean, I do believe that it's hopeful that there's so many brilliant people around the world studying it. And so we should have answers sooner right. than later. Yeah. Um, okay, so we knocked out a whole bunch of questions with that one as far as <laughs> risk factors. Um, how about the role of hormones um, in SCAD? I know you touched upon um, uh, postpartum and it being the number one cause if a woman is pregnant. How about like during menopause? I know there's a lot of women in the group who are like menopause, perimenopause and hormone levels changing then. Mm -hmm. Yes, that that's definitely a huge area of the research because there's been papers have been written on each of these specific things, but the issue is always, is it a case study of just like two people or, or was it, you know, 600 people? Um, but we do see a connection in, well, obviously pregnancy. Um, also, there have been situations where women have had SCAD with in vitro fertilization. Um, and then hormone fluctuation, you know, folks who have, have had difficult cycles and maybe have some um, taken medication over time for that. And then, like you say, the issue of premenopause, postmenopause. Um, and a paper we published or posted a paper on our um, Facebook page yesterday that discusses that. And it, it looks like they do see differences in people who, women who have it perimenopause and who have it postmenopause. So that's that's interesting. But again, it'll it'll take a lot of study. But yeah. I think I think the common thread you would hear from the SCAD survivor population is, well, I had my SCAD, you know, at this certain time of my cycle. Mary, you probably heard this. Or like I've heard a lot of women who are like me who had their big impact moment when they were nursing their baby, mm -hmm. which is another time when your hormones are doing Mm -hmm. different things so is, did you have you heard some more things yeah i mean i think for me nursing was a key element of it because i had stopped nursing in the springtime but anybody who's had a baby knows you can, you can stop nursing and things don't just go back to normal <laughs> and it was right around the time that i think um my hormone levels were dropping and starting to return, you know, back and I was about to start getting my period again, that all of a sudden it was like, you know, the hammer dropped. That's that's kind of the way I look at it. And it was it also coincided with large amounts of stress. Um, but any anybody who also has had big hormonal flux, fluctuations knows that that magnifies any stress that you have too. So right. kind of to me, I, I think of it as almost a cycle of those things. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Have Actually, they, have they determined any role that hormonal birth control plays in to SCAD at all? Like either good or bad? Bad, 
Well, that's a tough one. And I remember asking um, a researcher that years ago, like, well, maybe it's because we're all on birth control. And she was kind of right. like, okay, but how are you, you know, again, it's like yeah. the enormity of that. And it is true. And I've often thought like, well, maybe it's because our mothers, grandmothers, depending how old you are, <laughs> were in the first generation of, you know, using birth control pills for a range of, of mm-hmm. issues. You know, a lot of young teens get birth control pills, whether for good or bad, you know, for acne control or hormonal regulation, not necessarily birth control. So that is a very interesting piece of the equation. You know, what what does that do um, to the artery? Who knows? Yeah. Right. Great question. Yeah. Um, okay, so... I think we've covered almost all of these. I did have one thing that I definitely wanted to talk about for for this group. What kind of considerations do people need to take as far as working out afterwards? And also, is there things that they should consider, um, not to say that they think they might be prone. I don't know that anybody could really know that they're going to be prone to SCAD, but when you get into some activities like CrossFit and endurance training and things like that, what are considerations that need to be taken into account whether somebody has had SCAD or not? And then and then post-SCAD, what kind of workout routine are you looking at? Or is working out completely off the table? Like that kind of stuff. Did you want to talk, Mary, about like your experience sure. with Dr. Lewis and then I can fill in? Okay. Like <laughs> so I would say I would say um, my doctor when I had the SCAD was totally supportive of me continuing to try and be active. Um, she, you know, and and I think largely it depends on how um, serious your SCAD is and how much um, uh, what's the word intervention is needed. You know. Um, so for me, I was very lucky that mine was, you know, a mild heart attack. <laughs> if, if any heart attack could be considered mild. Um, so I didn't, I was, for three months, I was walking and that was all she wanted me to do. Keep her heart rate down, go out for walks, you know, get outside, be active, but no heavy lifting, you know, no running, just let yourself heal. And then um, she had me come back um, after three months to do a, a nuclear stress test, which um, they take imagery of your heart to measure the blood flow at rest. And then they have you get on a treadmill and um, you know, you're running and basically they max you out to um, see how your heart reacts to the strain and how your blood flow is and what um, kind of endurance you have, and they're measuring um, your heart rate and monitoring you the whole time. Um, I was really stressed out about doing the stress test because I thought I was going to flunk. And uh, in the end, it was great <laughs> because it let me know that um, I, I think at the time they said, yeah, you're in, you're in the 93rd percentile for women ages, you know, uh, I think it was like 30 to 40. And I'm like, oh, so... I am actually pretty physically fit, you know? <laughs> and then she had me do cardiac rehab and there's nurses there and they're monitoring me the whole time. And it was really, that was important for me. I mean, it was kind of hard because I, I was used to going to the gym and killing myself. And if I didn't leave feeling like I was gonna faint, I mean, I remember sometimes going to spin classes and feeling lightheaded and thinking like, oh, I'm doing a great workout. My heart rate is at like 185. I'm killing it. And um, that was the <laughs> worst possible thing for me to do, whether I was going to have a heart attack or not going to have, it just wasn't a healthy thing. Um, so I had to re- retrain. Um, and I still, you know, you sometimes, Jen, tell me like, Mary, just take, calm yourself down, you know, like relax. You don't need to be trying so hard all the time. And it's something that I, I still try to work on. But um, in terms of, you know, I, I ski, I play tennis, I exercise, I, I do pretty much everything I used to do. I think the difference is the way that I 
approach doing it now is different. I don't feel like being in pain means that I'm doing a good thing. <laughs> that That is such a great way to say it all. And I think there are so many women in particular that that's our, that's how we approach our life or did. And um, so I appreciate you being really honest and open about it because I think that's a message for everyone. You know, you know, Jennifer, you mentioned someone who doesn't know that they're going to have SCAD versus someone who has had a SCAD. And I really do think that, you know, as a society, we do kind of need to hit a reset button on what, what we view as, you know, the right way to be healthy versus living a competitive life in every single category of our existence. <laughs> so um, for the post-SCAD crowd, the comment is usually like, you know, run the 5K, but don't win the 5K. Like, just be happy that you're able to run again and you're out there and you're in the fresh air and you're, you know, doing what you love, but you don't need the medal around your neck. And, you know, you can play tennis, but you're not Serena or Venus Williams. <laughs> so just enjoy your tennis. Um, and I think that's just very, it's an interesting dynamic with women in heart disease too, because we've looked at anxiety and depression and the link with heart attack has definitely been proven and the link with heart disease has been proven. But I've always been interested in the causal uh, piece of the puzzle, you know, is, is undiagnosed anxiety or depression maybe a part of that whole intensive personality that causes us to go at things so over the top, you know, I can't even tell you, I, just the other day, somebody said to me, don't be so hard on yourself. <laughs> it's just like, that's who I am, you know, <laughs> so it's it's an interesting area and you know if anybody feels that they have anxiety or depression and you know can again use some tools that are out there now and apps mindfulness and you know meditation that kind of thing or speak to a professional to get some guidance to maybe make your life a little more peaceful and not as stressful that would be a great step for anybody and then in terms of the post scad piece again taking care of your emotional and physical needs. Um, there are weight restrictions, but again, I think that goes back to the idea that, you know, do we all really need to be able to throw a tri tire tractor, like a trash tire <laughs> across a room? Or, you know, is it not just enough to do some, you know, targeted hand weights to tone yourself? Like what is really the goal? And I think um, for the post-SCAD patient, it's, you know, having that self-confidence that your body's back working well and you can trust your heart. That's a good kind of mindset. You know, you want to be healthy, but you don't want to create stress for yourself by pursuing an exercise routine that's causing you stress because you're worried it's too much. You just want to, again, walk, bicycle, swim, um, you know, some of the training tapes I assume are fine, but I would always check with your doctor just just to be sure. And like Mary mentioned, the heart rate restrictions, everybody's different. So you're gonna wanna work with your clinician. And hopefully if you were to have any kind of heart issue, they would prescribe cardiac rehab for you. And then that's always the great first step is to you know, work with a clinician and be monitored. And then you can gain that confidence back in your body much more quickly. Yeah, I think confidence is really important afterwards. For maybe like six months afterwards, I was still convinced I was going to drop dead. <laughs> I was just waiting. I was waiting for that to happen. So the idea, and that's why I was so stressed out about my stress test. Ironically, I stressed yeah. about stress tests. Um, <laughs> I know. You think like you just, you're so terrified of everything. So I think that that was a yeah. really important thing to do. Yeah. Yeah. Well, PTSD, that's one area that we're studying too, because we do feel that this kind of um, blind side of a heart attack is, it qualifies for a, a trauma for sure. And um, we do feel that many patients exhibit PTSD symptoms post-SCAD and, you know, 
can continue for years, if not addressed. So that's a very, you know, it's, it's, it's real. And the thing about, you know, <laughs> the first time I had my stress treadmill, like the nurse literally <laughs> was back there making sure I didn't roll off. I mean, I just was so <laughs> freaked out and out of shape because I just had, you know, my baby. And, um, so, yeah. So all the things that, and, and this isn't kind of another form of advocacy too, because I feel like when you're dealing with medical professionals, you know, they're, they are doing their job and it helps to tell them like, you've never had a heart attack. How can you say mine is a small one? You know, like, like you said earlier and, you know, talking to them and communicating that I'm terrified of this treadmill test. And I think all this kind of education, little and big, is so beneficial for patients, particularly the SCAD population, to try and educate that, yes, it's a different form of heart attack, but, you know, if you can work with us, we can, we can all, you know, make it a better situation. Yeah. Um, talking about that, is, is SCAD pretty frequently misdiagnosed? And is there anything that, if you suspect that that's what you may have, or you suspect you have a heart attack and no one's gonna believe you when you go to the ER, is there something in particular that people can ask to have checked? Um, I know, I think it was Mary, was your EKG normal at first when you got to the hospital? And they- well, everything, everything was normal, the EKG was normal, the echo, um, which is an ultrasound that measures blood flow through the heart <clears throat> was normal. Um, the only thing that was a factor for me was troponin, but I took 12 hours to go to the ER. So my heart attack was at 10 a.m. I didn't go to the ER until 10 p.m. And the first few troponin tests that they did, blood, blood enzyme tests, were normal. So they kept me overnight and it wasn't until 2 a.m. that the blood work started coming back abnormal and, and increasingly so. So it was a number of hours later, um, like at least 12, no, 12 is when I got, at least like 15 hours later that you could even see anything abnormal. So had I raced right to the ER, I don't think they ever would have picked it up because everything at that point was normal. It wasn't until hours later that it was uh, flagged. And that's, I, that is a common story to hear that, because um, the, the, just for everybody's, the troponin enzyme is an indication of muscle, heart muscle death, basically, like the tissue itself is dying off and it releases this enzyme that they can track. Now, what they're supposed to do is do a series of these blood draws and like you're saying if you go and they send you home or if they if you go and they take one blood one blood draw which is what they did with me and then send you home you know they might miss those second third um same with the ekg a lot of people have a normal reading at first or they'll say oh you know well we thought it was normal for you but it's like well how would you know that if i've never had an ekg before um so the important thing I think when you're going to the ER is really as hard as it can be is to trust your gut and say, I am really worried about my heart. These are heart attack symptoms and tell them, like, I feel like something's wrong with my heart. And I know that there are things you can do to check it. And hopefully they'll offer the EKG and the troponin blood draw because neither one of them are terribly expensive is my understanding. Um, and then just knowing that you're there, you, you paid your copay regardless, you know, you want to stay until you get that answer. Um, and I think that's the hardest part. And if you have a family member who's a strong advocate and can be there with you and be supportive, um, but just listen to your instincts and just, just, you know, try to communicate what you know about your family history um, what you know about SCAD, and I think a lot of, you know, folks don't know about SCAD in the hospital system, unfortunately. Um, but if you can explain to them that, you know, I'm a really healthy person, 
I've never had heart problems before. I'm having these heart attack symptoms, you know, shortness of breath, chest pain, um, my arm feels numb. They should take care of you. I mean, that should be enough to get the full workup in a perfect world. And unfortunately, <laughs> we just have to advocate. We just have to believe in ourselves and advocate. Yes, especially right now. I think with the way the healthcare system is right now, um, it would be especially tough if you go in they're they're overtaxed they have so many people coming in um that you know if after a few hours they feel like well they had a convincing story but we can't really find it anything and we need we need to keep things moving you know like i think having sometimes i would not have gone to the hospital if it weren't for my family and i probably like I just wouldn't have made all the choices I made if I didn't have my family telling me, you need to do this. You, you know, you need to figure out what's going on. Um, and it's really hard for a patient to do that for themselves. Um, yeah. So. I know it, it is hard. I, I shouldn't make it sound like, you know, so blase because it, it is hard. But, um, and that's again why I, I've said in the beginning, you know, we don't want to scare anybody, but <laughs> the whole hope is by educating um, as many people as possible, it will just become part of the, the norm that there is a form of heart attack that affects women more often. And so if you're young, typically very fit, active, and out of nowhere, you have these classic symptoms that you got to get a look, you got to get looked at. Um, you, you have a page dedicated to this um, as the founder of SCAD Alliance. Do you want to tell us a little bit more about that and, and sure. let everybody know where they can go to get more information about it? Absolutely. Um, did you want me to, I can either just talk it through or I could pull up that slide, whatever we whichever, have time for. Whichever is easy. We, we, we've got time if you want to um, pull up that second screen share. So okay. Get. Um, I will do my best. <laughs> Wait a minute, where'd the green button go? There it is, screen share. <laughs> okay. Is it up? Yep, I see it. Okay. I'm not sure which form I'm in, so I'll just... Uh... Oops, I'm sorry. How about I just go to the last slide? and just do it that way can you see the i have like a sidebar yep yeah we can see everything. okay you can see it all okay well just briefly um scad alliance was founded to bring people together who are interested in scad regardless of specialty and we also wanted to involve patients families and um you know supporters friends um, to try and ramp up the support, understanding, and also research of SCAD. So we've done a lot. Our biggest motto is collaborate, collaborate, collaborate. And our first couple of years were focused mostly on the support piece and education. But then we realized, you know, as more cardiologists were begging us for a multi-center network or research network, we decided it definitely was time to, to do that. Um, so we, although we were founded in 2015, we just two years ago launched our ISCAD registry is what it's called. Um, and I had a slide. I see it here coming up. So we do a lot of communication. We're on pretty much every social platform. Um, we still are trying to build relationships with researchers, allied health professionals, other nonprofits. And in fact, Mary, she came and ran the booth with me <laughs> at the um, American Critical Care Nurses Conference in Boston a couple years ago. And that was, I appreciated your help so much. That was great. Um, and it's very rewarding to see a clinician come up and hear their story and then say, you know what, I had a patient that I'm sure now that that was SCAD and I regret that I didn't do more um, and it, it does it does have an impact to get out there and educate the professionals. Um, and then briefly, we you know the multi-center ISCAD registry is 
it's specific to state and locality. We're trying to get a center of excellence in every state um, and hopefully more so that we're bringing the expertise to the patient and getting opportunities for folks to enroll in research locally where their care can be documented and enrolled in the data set. Um, so right now we have 16 sites enrolling. It's about, it's been about a year and a half actually with four in the wings. We have 550 patients, more than that enrolled. And we're about to uh, write our first paper out of the data. So that's very exciting. And the difference again is that we involve the patients very much. We use their input for developing the questionnaires, the publications topics, and then by enrolling folks as near a diagnosis as possible, we can you know, capture that treatment going forward and then incorporate like you know, any additional trips to the ER that they had and any kind of psychosocial assistance that they had um, or you know, related issues of endocrinology or um, you know, rheumatology, whatever other factors that might be involved. And we can answer some of these really unique questions people have. Um, so just to reiterate, because I always feel this is important, I want to just throw up one more time the symptoms, which many people know, but, you know, it's, it's to me, we, we got to like get past this male female pattern thing and just communicate that these are the symptoms that are telling you your heart is telling you something is not right. Um, and your actually your gut should be on here too, because I tell you, for me, that's that's what convinced me that I was really in danger was this sense of I need to protect myself. This is a you know fighting bear mama moment where I gotta <laughs> gotta protect myself. Something is not right. So just be sure if you have any of these symptoms, you know, make the phone call, talk to your primary care doctor if they suggest it go to the ER, or if you just feel like, you know what, I would never feel this way. I haven't felt this way ever in my life. I'm going to the ER. And then for more information, we are, we have a website that we're always updating. It never seems to end. Um, so scatalliance.org. And then when you go on any social media platform, if you use at scatalliance, it should bring you right to our page. So we have a very, um, very useful YouTube channel now that has all of our Ask the Experts conversations that we've done this past year. We started it because of COVID, but it's really taken off. So if you have interest in, you know, you can hear a whole presentation on physical activity and the restrictions and things you should consider. And it's done by Dr. Melissa Wood at Mass General and some other colleagues. Um, we have psychosocial, we have FMD, we have um, emergency room considerations. So that's, that's a great resource. Twitter, we promote a lot of our programs on there and we post links to the videos and whatnot. Facebook, we have a public page. So we do have some conversation on there. Um, but I always, you know, want people to understand that it is public. So if you have a private concern or question that you don't want broadcast to the whole world, um, do remember that. But we do post as many of the media articles and scientific journal articles on there as we can and fundraise of course there's always the need for that instagram is a new i'm a newbie to it but we're trying and we're on pinterest and linkedin um and then as you see down here there's my email address katherine.leon at scatalliance.org you can always get me through that but um it's just, I'm just so grateful that you were interested and. Yeah. Yeah. And, uh, I will, when this is, when the live ends, if anybody is interested in getting more information and you want to check out um, the Scout Alliance, I will leave the, all the links um, in the comments uh, underneath the video so that people can figure out more, find more, okay. find you on the internet and some of the social pages too. Um, I think we, I don't think we have any other questions. Um, so I don't know if, if you guys want to wrap up with anything. So I, I had something I, a few years ago, I did a presentation, um, 
actually to coworkers. Like I said, I work in healthcare and it was really important to me. My mission at work really changed after or deepened, I would say, after I had this issue because um, I realized even people who work in, in healthcare and hospitals on a day-to-day -day basis, you don't necessarily appreciate it until you're the person on the end of the medical device, you know, um, depending on it. And um, so I had put together um, a presentation on population health and precision care and understanding patterns. And one particular slide I, I wanted uh, to really make impactful, I had gone back to people um, one of the SCAD pages that um, I knew and I said, hey, would you guys be willing to let me use your profile picture for a slide? And uh, more people responded yes than I could fit on the slide. <laughs> and um, I thought it was really, I'm going to share my screen if you can see it, yeah, yeah. that it was really you, um, a meaningful, I'm sorry? I said, how did I miss that earlier? <laughs> I know, this is the best part. <laughs> so, and so this is me, obviously, I'm a, a SCAD survivor, but um, these are other folks. And, you know, when you really see all of the young faces and people that you would totally not expect and it's seemingly, you know, it's, is it, what, is, what is the pattern? How could you pick a pattern out here when you see all these faces? And, you know, the patterns are there. Um, and I think uh, Catherine and SCAD Alliance are doing a lot of work along with a lot of um, medical researchers to try and identify all of them. Um, and that's, you know, to me, that's really meaningful. And I think not just for SCAD, but for so many different um, conditions. There's so much to, to learn, I think, in healthcare. Um, but this was something that I was passionate about and something that happened to me. So I appreciate you uh, including it this this uh, heart month, Jen, for, for the group. Yeah, share share your share your slide with everybody so we can see it. Because uh, yeah. oh, you can't see it. I shared it. I'm sorry. Nope, I thought I had it sharing. <laughs> Hold on. Technology whole story, and I wasn't even sharing That's the slide. That's okay. We Everybody. want to see the short slide. You built the excitement. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I'm so sorry. As I was talking, I thought I was sharing it. <laughs> you can see the slide now, right? There's yes, the, we can see it now. Yeah. There's all yeah. of the uh, the folks who sent me their pictures, and like I said, I I continued. I had to do this for um, a presentation, but I continued to get people responding. Oh, you can use mine. You can use mine. And, um, you know, there's so many pictures with people and their children and their family members and um, young, you know, healthy looking people. So, yeah. yeah. I think that's what strikes me the most about it is just how young and fit everybody looks. Um, it is definitely eye-opening and not what you expect to see when you have a collage of photos up from people who've had heart attacks. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So mm. that was all I wanted to, I wanted to <laughs> share. Um, but thank yeah. you for the opportunity to, uh, to talk about it today. And Catherine, thank you for no. joining I was so honored that you reached out. I appreciate it. How, your your picture from the conference in Boston popped up the other day. I was like, oh, I wonder what Mary's doing. And then you wrote. So I was so excited to be part of this. And um, again, if anybody has questions, I'm always here. And you know, if you if you look at the percentage of the one to four percent, and you think of SCAD in that terms probably more likely you'll be able to help someone else who might have SCAD. I think that's the real message too, is that, you know, by educating, we can be aware and, and help others seek care if they, if they need it. Um, but uh, anyway, happy heart month to all. And thank you so much, Jennifer. Thank, well, thank you to for all you do. In and spending so much time in here, letting everybody know what SCAD is all about. Um, just, awareness is is just huge um so 
So thank you for helping with that. And um, to everybody who watched live with us, we had a whole bunch of people watching live with us. Uh, the video will be up inside the group. So if you want to, um, if you want to check back on it, it will be in here. I'm not going to take it down or anything. So um, video will be here and I will include the links to, um, to Catherine's pages at, so you can go and get more information for yourself too. So um, thank you. Thank you to everybody. I'm going to stop our stream here. It was good to see everyone.